Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm, I'm sorry not to be in Umeå, which I'm sure must be extremely beautiful at this time of year, uh, but that couldn't be helped. Um, um, you'll see the, the title is not the one that's advertised. That's because I thought that rather than talking about ethical analysis and its connection with climate change, I would do better actually to do some ethical analysis. I thought we might be more pleased about that. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of the objectives of public health. Uh, public health is, is concerned with the best use of using the resources that we've got in order to promote health. That means it's concerned with setting priorities among alternative uses for our resources, and it's a setting of priorities I'm going to talk about. Uh, one way of promoting health is to limit climate change, and that way of doing it needs to be given its proper place in the scale of priorities uh, um, we have for all the other things that need doing. Um, so in order to put it correctly in the scale, we're going to have to make a judgment about the benefits of controlling climate change, the costs of, of doing so, and compare those with other things that we might do with our resources. I'm going to start with the, the benefits, I'll come to costs later. Um, climate change is caused by emissions of greenhouse gas, particularly carbon dioxide. So I'm going to start by um, talking about the amount of benefit that can be achieved by reducing our emissions by one tonne of carbon dioxide. So this is going to be the benefit per tonne. Um, and that's something that um, economists are already used to thinking about. Um, the benefit per tonne of reducing emissions, they call this the social cost of carbon. Um, it's the harm done by emitting one tonne of carbon dioxide. So conversely, the benefits achieved by not emitting one tonne or by extracting one tonne from the atmosphere. And economists measure this, but because they're economists, um, they do it in particular ways that uh, are not ideal. Um, for one thing, they measure benefits in terms of money, just because that's what economists do. Um, but more seriously, in order to do that, to measure them in terms of any single quantity, they have to collapse all the various good things that controlling climate change does down into one scale. And that involves doing <clears throat> quite some violence to our values and it requires various dubious assumptions and dubious methods. Um, particularly over one of the benefits, which is the saving, or to put it another way, the extending of people's lives. Economists' ways of putting this into their figures are definitely dubious. Um, to take a simple example, they take the lives of people who live later in history to be less valuable than the lives of people who live earlier. This is called discounting. And typically, not all economists, but many economists count later lives less than earlier lives. It's also true that their methods of valuation can't encompass quite a number of important values that are affected by climate change. For instance, they can't take account properly of the suffering of animals, and they can't take account um, of any value that nature in itself has. For example, the, the, the loss, the value of the loss of the uh, natural species um, that are destroyed by climate change. So there's a lot left out. So any figure that economists come up with, the social cost of carbon needs to be treated with caution. Um, we could say that it understates the benefit of reducing emissions just because a great deal is left out. But I'm going to mention the figure just because it gives us some idea about the scale of the harm that's done by uh, climate change. I can't, it's, it's hard to mention just one figure because economists disagree about what the social cost of carbon is, but there is a sort of consensus around the figure of 50 or $60 per tonne of carbon 
uh, dioxide. So that means an emission of one ton is thought to do about six, 50 or 60 dollars worth of harm around the world in all the various different ways that it does, ton, uh, does harm. To give you an idea of what this amounts to, you might like to know that an average Swede emits um, four and a half tons per year. This is, that's actually a very low figure uh, amongst um, Western countries. Um, so that gives us that the average Swede um, does about uh, $270 worth of harm through her emissions per year and about $20,000 in an average uh, Swedish lifetime. So that gives you an idea of this, the, the scale of harm that each of us uh, does as economists would measure it. It does include in the figure, or at least it should include, um, the harm that's done by shortening people's lives uh, around the world. We've had um, a lot of explanation of why people's lives are shortened um, through, through health, and there are also um, direct effects uh, caused by climate disasters and so on. So um, climate change shortens people's lives, um, uh, and that is what I am now going to concentrate on. Um, because the economist methods of setting uh, a value on this harm are, are so poor, um, and because we in this uh, meeting are interested in public health in particular, I'm going to set aside monetary values and I'm going to focus on just this one harm uh, of shortening lives. Um, so we can um, once more look at this per tonne of emissions of carbon dioxide. So I'm going to give you, make an attempt to give you um, uh, uh, some figure for how much harm we do by uh, emissions. This is actually, this is not, uh, um, this is an important part of the harm done by uh, climate change. There's some reason to think that the shortening of lives is actually the biggest harm that climate change does. So it's well worth putting a special focus on that. So in the Economist's $60 figure, if they've done it right, um, the, the loss of life um, should be a big part of that figure. Um, I've been able to get to make a calculation of the harm that we as individuals, uh, that we do, each of us, by emitting um, uh, carbon dioxide, by using the work of a um, team of economists um, who used an enormous amount of computing power, very sophisticated methods and extraordinarily detailed data to produce some figures for what they call the mortality costs of uh, climate change. Um, I've given you the reference to that study there. Um, if you want, I'll e email me and I'll uh, tell you about it. Um, unfortunately, they reported their results in terms of money because they are um, economists after, uh, after all. Um, so they valued quantities of life in monetary terms. And I've already said that the way of doing that is sort of dubious. Um, so I have uh, extracted from these figures that they produce using very, very crude methods. Um, uh, I've worked out on the basis of the figures they produced, what are the actual effects on the length of people's lives um, hidden underneath them. Um, I'm sorry to say, I don't think the authors are particularly impressed by the way that I've done this. Uh, it is very crude. But since they didn't do it themselves, I really don't see I've got any choice. So I'll give you the figures that I've reverse engineered from their work for what they're worth. Before I do that, I need to explain one thing though. Um, basic data for this study are local death rates graphed against local temperatures. They have um, data of this sort for thousands of different regions uh, of the world. And each of them uh, can be put in a, a graph, and the, the shape of the graph is, is roughly this, it's U-shaped. It shows that um, there's, there's a, a temperature at which the death rate in the particular region is at a minimum, and if the temperature gets much below that or gets much above it, then the death rate goes up. The, 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 the minimum is generally about the average temperature in the region. So, this is because people are adapted to the place where they live, 
and they tend to die if the temperature deviates from what they're used to in either heat waves or cold waves. That's the explanation of this uh, graph. But it does mean that if we're trying to work out the harm done by um, climate change, it's going to depend a lot on how much we do to control climate change. If climate change is going to be very bad, if there's going to be a, a, a serious climate change, then extra emissions do much more harm because the extra emissions are taking place where temperatures are already high and the death rate is much more affected by temperatures in that region. Um, on the other hand, if we have climate change reasonably under control, the harm done by each extra ton is going to be less bad. And that means I'm going to give you two different figures for the amount of harm done by emissions. Um, these um, were dictated for me by the study that I just um, uh, reported on. They come from two different um, representative concentration pathways, which the IPCC presented in its 2014 uh, report. These are two different um, scenarios, you might say, for how the world might respond to climate change. One called RCP 8.5 is a very pessimistic scenario. It's chosen to represent business as usual if the world does really nothing much about climate change at all. We're going to do better than that, although we're not responding to climate change in anything like the degree we should, we are doing something about it. Um, RCP 4.5, which is the other one I'm going to be talking about, is more optimistic and we might possibly manage to achieve that. Um, so of the numbers I'm going to give, the ones related to 4, RCP 4.5 are the ones that are more uh, immediately um, relevant. Um, so here are the figures that I get out. So in RCP 8.5, the pessimistic one, one ton of emissions of carbon dioxide shortens life as a whole uh, by 44 hours. And that means um, uh, that a, a typical Swedish lifetime shortens um, lives around the world by about 1.8 years. In RCP 4.5, it's four hours per ton in just two months for a typical Swedish uh, lifetime emissions. Generally, your emissions of um, carbon dioxide are not going to shorten any particular person's life by these amounts. Generally, what they're going to do is spread around the world and shorten lives for a, by, uh, shorten a lot of people's lives um, all over the world. You might easily actually um, do more than this. Uh, you might um, shorten lives by much more than this. For example, your emissions might tip the balance that creates a national disaster, in which case you might actually kill quite a number of people by your emissions. But these are the average figures. They can certainly could be very far wrong. They could be out, I would think, by a factor of two or three, but I hope they're not out by a, an order of magnitude, um, uh, at least. Um, one thing to point out about these figures is that they're not zero. Uh, quite a lot of people have the feeling that their own emissions don't do any harm just because they're so small in relation to the problem. Well, they are small in relation to the problem, but the problem itself is huge. So each of us does this much harm by our emissions, and it's significant. Um, I don't think that anybody um, would want to shorten lives, any lives, by two months. That's a significant amount of harm. Now, I want to balance that against the cost of reducing our emissions, and that is surprisingly difficult to um, uh, come up with. There's a big range of uh, figures offered by economists for this. I've chosen, because it's the one most easily approachable by each of us, a figure of about $10, which is at the high end of the price that's available to us as individuals for offsetting our own emissions. You know how offsetting uh, is, uh, works or is supposed to work. Uh, you pay some company to um, uh, do things which reduce emissions around the world. Sometimes they plant trees, perhaps more reliably. They um, uh, provide people living in poor countries facilities 
to live their lives um, in ways that don't involve so much emissions, for example, by providing efficient um, cooking stoves to people who live in uh, Africa and, and India. Well, suppose that is the price, about $10 per tonne, we can get that $1 spent on reducing emissions uh, extends life by 4.4 hours in RCP 8.5 and 0.4 of an hour in RCP 4.5. Um, to put this conversely, the cost of extending a lifetime um, by uh, reducing emissions, um, sorry, no, a year of life, the cost of extending life by a year um, with, uh, uh, by reducing emissions is um, near enough $2,000 in RCP 8.5 and near enough $22,000 in RCP 4.5. So this gives you an idea of the benefits that can be achieved by spending money on reducing uh, emissions. I thought it worth comparing that with what the UK National Health Service is willing to pay for extending lives. Um, it, it tells us that it'll pay for medical treatments that cost up to uh, $35,000 or, so, $35, or so per quality. So the quality is a quality adjusted life year. It's not just an ordinary life year, it's rather more valuable than a life year, but you can see the 35,000 is of roughly the same order as the 21,000 that I came up with for RCP 4.5 as the cost of saving life by, um, uh, reducing uh, climate change. Interestingly, the NHS has published a report um, entitled um, Delivering a National Health, uh, a, a carbon, um, a, a zero carbon national health service, which explains that it's planning um, to use actually quite a substantial proportion of its resources on reducing its carbon uh, footprint. So the NHS is going to take the resources which have been given to it by the government with the intention of improving health, and it's going to use those to reduce its carbon emissions. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually explain why it's planning uh, to do that, but an implication of these figures is that the NHS is setting a value on people's lives around the world it's not, that's not far short of the value it sets on UK people's lives, which I think is certainly a very interesting thing to uh, show up. Um, but you should realize this is a very tentative conclusion um, for the various reasons that I've listed there. Um, this is, uh, NHS is dealing with qualities, which are um, more valuable than uh, lives on average. Um, uh, reducing carbon emissions brings lots of other benefits besides extending life. That's another thing to bear in mind. And also the overall um, consideration is these figures that we're dealing with are definitely not very reliable. Um, but it's worth noticing that even if we only think in terms of orders of magnitude, there are much cheaper ways of extending life than reducing carbon dioxide emissions. On the website GiveWell, which um, is a a serious analysis of these things. Um, uh, it tells us that uh, charities can save a life for about uh, 2,500 pounds if they're spent particularly on curing tuberculosis. Um, uh, so if that gives, say, 40 years of life, this tells us that you can save a year of life by this means, contributing to a charity that uh, reduces tuberculosis for about $62.5. Uh, another example, there's a recent um, commission from The Lancet, which has suggested that malaria could be eradicated at a cost of some tens of billions of dollars. Uh, that's a very vague amount. Um, that would save about half a million lives per year. And if we count just the first uh, 20 years um, after eradication, that means it would save 10 million lives for, shall we say, to be on the generous side, hundred billion dollars. And that comes to uh, $10,000 per life save, which is just $250 per year, which is again, much less than the cost of saving lives by um, reducing uh, carbon emissions. So what should we conclude from that? 
Well, you might think we should conclude that resources should not be put into reducing emissions, but instead into other means of extending lives. Well, I think it does mean something like that for an individual. If you've got some resources as an individual and you want to um, put them into um, saving lives, well, doing it by reducing your emissions is not the best way of doing it. You could do it by insulating your house and in various other ways, but you would do more good to give the money to tuberculosis charities, say. Nevertheless, I think we should reduce our emissions, but that's not on the grounds of the amount of good that we achieve by doing it. It's on the grounds of, of justice, which is another very important moral consideration. We do harm by our emissions, and we're not morally permitted to do harm to others for our own um, uh, benefit. So when you do harm by emissions, you are doing an injustice to other people, and we shouldn't do that. So this is a, 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 an important reason for doing what we can to reduce our emissions, and indeed really reduce them to zero if, uh, if possible. But what about governments? Well, governments are different from individuals because they can mobilize enormously greater resources than individuals um, other than Bill Gates uh, can. Um, my calculations have been for what economists call marginal changes, the effect that and uh, reducing emissions by some extra, by one extra ton, the benefit that's achieved by reducing just by one ton, um, or and the, so the cost of emissions is the cost of increasing emissions by one ton. But governments have to look far beyond what they can achieve by a marginal change, a small change. Um, and climate change is a much, much bigger problem than malaria. Climate change threatens the lives of many more people. Of course, governments should indeed eradicate malaria and treat tuberculosis. Those are comparatively cheap things of doing, and obviously they should do those. But as well as that, and whether or not they do that, they should put resources into controlling climate change because although at the margin these resources do less good, the total resources that they can put into controlling climate change can do much good, more good than the resources they can put into controlling uh, malaria. And I've got a diagram which is going to, which, which shows that, it's coming up. Um, what it shows is that if you're going to spend relatively small amounts of money, you do more good by uh, eradicating malaria or attempting to eradicate malaria and by reducing tuberculosis. But in total, there's much more good to be achieved by, claim, by um, controlling climate change. And here's the picture. So this is a graph of the benefit in terms of saving life, the marginal benefit in terms of saving life, against the amount of dollars which are being put into saving life. Don't think of this as a sequential process as you put more and more in over time, this is what happens. This is not that, this is a counterfactual diagram. It's saying, if you were to put this quantity of dollars into dealing with climate change, what benefit would you get? And it shows that if you were to put some um, small amount of money into climate, uh, say this amount of money, into um, reducing uh, death, um, saving people's lives, you get much more benefit by spending it on malaria or on tuberculosis, less by spending it on reducing climate change. But if you're a government and have available dollars of this quantity, and you're going to put them into um, saving lives, you do much better to put them into climate change. Um, of course, you would do even better if you first eradicated malaria, um, but whether or not you do that, you can get much, a great deal of benefit by putting your money into um, uh, reducing climate change. And that's my conclusion.